All right. So, on your tables, you will see some paper and a Bible and a pen. Right now, everybody take a piece of paper and everybody take a pencil or pen. A paper and a pencil. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. I am going to begin to list things. 1 through 20. You need to write down what I, what I say. They're not going to be long things. It's not going to be complicated things. But you need to keep track of what I say and get them 1 through 20 down on your paper. All right. Does everybody, does everybody understand? Yeah. All right. Here are the rules. Here are the rules for this. I will not repeat, and you must not cheat off your neighbor's paper. So there's, this is an integrity thing too, right? So I will not repeat a word that I say, so don't say, what? Don't say, what? Can you say that again? Don't say, oh, I didn't hear you. Okay, none of that. None of, I will not care. All right, so I'm going to begin to list things. Does everybody's pen work? I realize that sometimes pens get dysfunctional. Okay, all right. So here we go. Are you ready? You sure? How many of you have a bunch of anxiety going on right now in your hearts? Okay, I'm sorry about that. We'll, we'll pray for you. All right, here we go. Cat. Dog. Red, six, hat, Bob, fly, Tim, bacon, church, song, TV, List, cry, small, heavy, Bible, Jesus, God, Holy Spirit. Okay, put your pencils down. Stop. Pencils down. Pencils down. Pencils down. Don't look at your neighbor's paper. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Candy! Candy in the morning! All right. Tori and Austin wanted to throw sodas, but we thought that might be a little dangerous. All right, here we go. Here are the, here are the words. Here are the words. You ready? Cat. Dog. Red. Six. Hat. Bob. Fly, Tim, Bacon, Church, Song, TV, List, Cry, Small, Heavy, Bible, Jesus, God, Holy Spirit. Did anybody get them all? Nice. How many of you missed two or more? You missed two or more. All right. So... What? All right, listen up. Shh. What are some of the reasons that you missed? Jessica. Just give me a, what was a reason you didn't get all of them? There were a lot of voices, noises, and voices. All right, shh. shh, shh. Hold on. You're going to have lots of time to talk this morning. Hold on. Kate. Okay, so you misunderstood what I said, Nicole. Yeah, I thought called my name and then hit me in the face with chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> called my name and hit me in the face with chocolate. Yes, Jack. First of all, I'm terrible at spelling. Second of all, 
Okay, I went too fast, and maybe you're not a fast speller. That, that's good. Dylan. I got hit in the head with a piece of candy. Got hit in the head with a piece of candy. And, uh, yeah. Now, um, how many of you were pretty distracted by things going on around the room? All you tens? You're like, yep, yep, easy. Um, how many of you, did any of you get so far behind you sort of just gave up? You're like, I, I don't know. You just started skipping words. You're like, I think he's on number 12, right? Or you end up, shh, you end up, anybody end up feeling discouraged because you couldn't hear or it just, it wasn't working. Somebody was messing you up, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. Well, here is the reality. You can only do one thing at a time. Those of us who like to pride ourselves in being multitaskers, anybody in here a multitasker? You know, I can do seven things at the same time. We can't. We try and talk ourselves into that. We try and make ourselves look like we can get more done than everybody else and that we can, we can do. The reality is you can only do one thing at a time. You can only focus on one thing at a time. And whenever you try and do more than one thing at a time, which does happen in life, yes? I mean, there are times you just, you have to do two things at once. Sometimes you have to do homework and watch TV. I mean, there are times you just have to do that. But whenever, whenever you're doing more than one thing at a time, one of those things will suffer. Probably both those things will suffer. And you won't be able to do this, the, both those things as well as if you were only doing one thing at a time. All right, the Bible in on your table. Open it up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Last week we did chapter 1. Remember we talked about fanning the flame into fire where Paul is talking to Timothy and he's saying, hey, don't just sit back and be religious. Let the Holy Spirit move in your life. What was it? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. All right? At your table, quickly, read verses 1 and 2. Read it out loud. Okay, so Paul, okay. <laughs> Paul is sitting in prison. He's on death row. He's chained to a wall. He has likely been beaten severely. He is likely starving. He's probably sick. He is unhealthy. He's malnourished. He's probably laying in his own filth. And he's waiting to be beheaded. He, know this, he knows this is coming. He asks the guard to please give him something that he can write a letter with. And like we did last week, he wrote his final letter. And he chose to write to this young guy named Timothy. Timothy was a guy that he had, apprentice, that he had mentored and that he had encouraged Timothy. Now, what is Paul's one focus? Be more specific than God. Jesus. Paul's one focus, Jesus. You ask Paul, hey, how's it going? Jesus, right? All he wants to do, all he considers important is to make Jesus known, to let people know that it is only through Jesus that you can be saved, to make sure that no one gets, in this, get this, gets this in their head that somehow they can just be a good person, that they can earn God's love, that they somehow deserve God's love. But he wants them to know without a shadow of a doubt that it is Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus that'll save them. And so he writes to Timothy with final instructions. 
Imagine getting this letter. Last week, you wrote a letter saying maybe goodbye, saying some sentimental things like, I'll miss you. I wish I, have, I had known this was going to happen ahead of time. I, I, or maybe it was with some instructions. Please take care of my Beanie Baby collection. Please take care of the cat. Please tell everyone how good I was at geometry, whenever it may be. And so he tells Tim, look, here is what you need to understand. And he says, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So Paul is saying this, don't just think the things that I've said are a good idea and agree with them. I would say this to you. Don't just come to youth group and listen to me talk and go, sounds good. Sure. I might as well believe that. Don't just show up to church and get into church mode and Bible mode where we all kind of just nod our heads, try and stay awake and go on about our lives. And I real guys, I'm the same as you. I realize it's, it's very easy to do. Paul is telling Tim, look, don't just think this stuff's a good idea. Share it with others. But don't just share it with others. Share it with who? Everyone. Everyone. Well, don't just share it with others. Share it with what kind of others? Non-believers. People that you trist, tr trist, trust. And also, people share it with others who are going to share it with others. Be on the lookout for people that you can talk to about Jesus. That who in turn will also realize, wow, I've got to share this with other people. So he's saying, look, don't just huddle up. Don't just gather at church. Don't just keep this little secret amongst yourselves. Go out and share the truth of Jesus with other people. Paul is absolutely focused on getting this message out. And he's telling Timothy the very same thing. Teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So let me ask you this. Has anyone in your circle of influence, whether they're at your table or at your school or on your hockey team or whatever it may be, has anyone in your circle of influence heard about Jesus from you? Now, some of you, you're like, yep. Some of you, maybe that yes is, yeah, I talk to people at youth group about Jesus all the time. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that doesn't count. That is not meaningless because there's a whole lot of people at youth group, dare I say all of us, who need to be encouraged about Jesus, right? So it's not that it doesn't count, but I can tell you that it is a whole lot easier for me to talk to you guys here at church on Sunday during this time when you're all expecting it and this is sort of what you know is going to happen than it is for me to talk with somebody that maybe I'm not sure what they believe. Has anybody in your circle of influence heard about Jesus from you? Have you brought anyone in your circle of influence to a place where they could hear about Jesus? whether it's youth group or church or Christian club at your school or a night of worship, whatever it may be, have you, have you ever been the cause of someone coming to a place where they were going to hear about Jesus? This is what Paul is telling Timothy he must do. If the word of God is going to spread, if the truth of Jesus is going to spread, then we have to let people hear it from our lives. And we have to bring them to places where they are going to be able to grow and they're going to be encouraged in their faith. Is youth group a club just for you? No. Hopefully, in our hearts, we realize, no, this, this isn't just a club just for me so I can be happy and I can feel good. What are you going to do about it? Because if our youth ministry here isn't 
including and bringing in more people, not so we can have a room full of people. All I have to do is have pizza and hand out iTunes cards and we could pack this room. <laughs> You're like, please. I get it. But if we aren't bringing friends, if we aren't including others who need to hear the truth of God, it is just a club. Congratulations, you joined an exclusive club where you're keeping other people out, where you're happy as long as you have your core group of friends. And Paul is telling Timothy, this must not be. And he tells Timothy, go to others and teach them about Jesus. What are you teaching the people in your circle of influence about Jesus, whether they are Christians or not, whether they come to church or not, what are you teaching your friends about Jesus? This, you could teach them in the way you act. You could teach them in the way you treat people. You could teach them by <coughs> teaching them scripture and letting them know what the Bible says and what the Bible means. What are you teaching the people in your circle of influence about Jesus? Paul is reminding Timothy, look, don't just call yourself a Christian, put on that Christian name badge, go about your life and hope somebody notices. I know that there's been a whole lot of my life where that's been what I do. Oh, I hope somebody notices I'm a Christian. I hope somebody sees that I'm a nice person and they just magically draw the conclusion, oh, he must be a Jesus follower. I hope somebody notices that I don't cuss all the time and they go, oh, he doesn't swear a lot. He must love Jesus with all his heart. I must find out about this. And that's what we kind of wish. What are you teaching your friends about Jesus? Do you ever leave, and I, I was thinking, as I was like thinking about this question, do you ever teach your friends about Jesus? Um, do you ever leave youth group on a Sunday or on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday and something you've heard, something we've, we've learned from the Bible, you're like, that's really good. Not necessarily the way that Jeff presented it. That was silly, but, but man, that's a good thing to remember. That's a good thing to know. I should tell people about that. And then you get to school. Maybe you even have a name. Oh man, I've, I've got to tell Steve about this because I know he's been struggling with this. Oh, I need to, you know, I'm going to talk to Michelle about this because I know she was asking me the other day and I didn't have an answer for it. You maybe even have a specific person. And then you get back to school. You get back online. You get into the daily routine and you just forget and you never end up saying anything to anybody. That thing that God stirred up in your heart, that thing that, God, that God's word taught you, stir some of them and we get excited and then we get distracted. We go out there and it's all the shiny things and we forget. Now, in verses three through six, Paul gives three illustrations to Timothy, all right? He paints three word pictures about how we are supposed to go out and share. At your table, I want you to read through each of those illustrations. There's an illustration um, about a soldier, an illustration about an athlete, and an illustration about a farmer. I want, what is, what do you think is the one main point for each of those things? Not, not what's the one point for all three of them, but each one has a point. What do you think is the one main idea for each of those illustrations? All right, I'm going to give you about three minutes to sit at your table and talk about this. Don't talk about other things. Don't get distracted. Talk about this. So read um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, and there's going to be three, three illustrations. Find out what the main point for each one is.
All right, stay focused. Don't, don't start talking about other stuff. You should definitely be on the farmer analogy by now. Okay. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officers who enlisted them. What did you guys come up with as the main idea? Why, what, what Paul is trying to communicate to Timothy through this analogy? Sarah. Um, for the soldier one, we thought it was like, he's saying don't get, um, they don't get wrapped up in the affairs of civilian life. Like, you can't please God if you're like tied up in the things of this world. Okay. You can't, you can't please God if you're tied up in the things of this world. What else? Any other things? Is a soldier's life any different than a civilian's life? Yes. How? How is a soldier's life any different than a civilian's life? More regimented. What else? They're disciplined. They're fight. Okay. What is a soldier's number one job? To, to fight, to protect. To, and they, now, if they go off, and this is where it says, it, he makes a clear distinction between a soldier's life and civilian life. It says a soldier can't be distracted by the stuff of civilian life. What if, okay, there's, what if a soldier is standing up on a wall, on top of a wall, surrounding city, and his, his job is to guard this area, and he starts looking out, and he looks at, oh, this guy, he's getting gas. And, oh, gas is two sixty nine a gallon. Huh. Oh, he's going in to get some snacks. Oh, wonder what kind of corn nuts. Oh, Funyuns. Oh. Like it's, that dude is going to get sniped right off that wall, right? He's, he can't afford to get caught up in the stuff that is not his job. Paul is saying to Timothy, what's Timothy, what's, what's Paul's job? Jesus. Okay, Jesus is, you, and he's going, Timothy, you can't get distracted by all the other things that civilian life, that culture says is important. Look, you can't serve God and be devoted to God when money and success is the thing you live for. You can't honor God and live as God has called you to live, if making everybody around you think you're cool and having status is your number one priority. It can't happen. And you can try and focus on both things, but like we said before, both those things are gonna suffer. So he's making that distinction. Look, people who have one focus, single-mindedness, they can't, pay attention to all the th other things around them that aren't part of their job. You guys, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, what has to be your number one focus? Jesus. 
Living for him, listening for him, obeying him, all of these have to be the things that we put above everything else. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. What, why, this seems a little strange. Like why now all of a sudden Paul's talking football. Now he's talking track and field. Wait, what was the main idea? The prize would be spending eternal life with Jesus. And okay. You can't like win that without following the rules. What does he mean by following the rules? Like, like, Lacey. Okay, so, so if you're like, so like if you're Tom Brady and you're focused on deflating all the balls, then you're not gonna focus on playing the game. What, Lacey? What an awesome, really mean. Analogy. That was us. If Tom Brady is focused on deflating all the balls, he's not going to be focused on playing the game, on doing the right thing. Absolutely. The athlete is focused on the goal of winning. All, all they, if they want to get the prize, if they want to win the race, they have to be focused on playing the game. And what happens usually? If you cheat when you're playing a game, what happens to you? You get kicked out of the game, right? You get penalized. You get, and so, so Paul is going, look, live your life in a way that is not going to disqualify you from what God has for you. And running the race according to the rules requires finishing the race. It requires finishing the race, you guys. And so it can't be this thing of like, oh, well, yeah, I live for Jesus on Tuesday night until Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock, and then I'm tired of living for Jesus. Oh, well, I'm on fire after Wednesday night at youth group, and I just, man, that feels so good until Friday when I have all those tests, and man, I just got to do what I got to do, you know? An athlete has to be focused on running the race, and doing what God is calling them to do. Galatians 6, 9 says, so let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You guys, don't give up. If following God, if pursuing God is what you're trying to do, don't give up. Because he is with you and he will empower you. But it's so easy to get distracted and lose our focus because, oh man, I'm just tired or I, I feel so behind. I've messed up too much. So I'm just going to give up. Never mind. I can't be a good Christian. Don't give up. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. What is Paul saying to Timothy here? Carter. If you work hard, then you should be the first one to enjoy it. Well, that's what they just said. Okay. <laughs> Jacob. Uh, you're working hard for something. And one of the things that we need to not skip over, that living for Jesus is going to be what? Hard. Not because you have to perform and you have to follow all the rules and you have to do all these rituals and all that. But living for God is going to be hard. There's going to be a whole lot of people who come against you. It, a whole lot of times in our life, it's going to feel like Tori and Austin are working against you. They're trying to throw things in your way so you can't do what you really want to do and you're trying, but you're not doing it for nothing. And God is, and here, Paul is reminding Timothy, look, you're not just trying to be a good person. Your goal is not to be a good person. You're not, your goal is not to just have good manners. And he wants us to understand that, look, if you are willing to work, and it will be work, and it's not work to earn it, it's not work to deserve it, it's work to go, you know what? When you work hard, there will be fruit. You guys, when you work hard to live for Jesus, when you are willing to give him everything, fruit will come out of it, and you will see your friends coming to Jesus. You will see your friends encouraged. You will see miracles in your life where you're th you thought things were just beyond hope. You will see God at work. But what are you going to do? Show up on Tuesday night, nod your head, and walk away? Show up on Wednesday night, play dork ball, 
mouth the words to some songs and walk out. If we are willing to put in the work of following Jesus, again, and when I say work, I want to be really careful that it's not work to earn it. If you're willing to put in the work to follow Jesus and let him lead your life, there will be fruit. Ultimately, this is what he's saying. Beyond warfare, there's victory. You're going to have to fight, but there will be victory. Beyond athletic effort, there's a prize. And beyond agricultural hard work, oh, hard, hand, hand, hand work. Okay. That's weird. Beyond agricultural hard work <laughs> is a crop. There will be a benefit to this. And I love how Paul wraps up this section. He doesn't just say, so there, good luck. He says this, think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. You guys, you may not know all the things in your life that God is trying to do right now. You may not understand why it seems like so many things are coming against you. You may not know why when you pray right now, it doesn't seem like God is answering your prayers. When you're listening for God, it seems like he's silent. You may not get any of that right now, but we have the promise that God is with us. He's never going to leave us. And here, Paul is reminding Tim, look, think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. Let's ask God to help us understand what he has for us and how to be good soldiers, how to be good athletes, and how to be good farmers. Who wants to be a farmer? That's right. <laughs> Father God, we ask you to help us. Help us understand all these things and help us to understand the stuff that you're doing in our life because sometimes it's really hard and we don't. And we need you to, to understand it, and help us understand and to remind us that you are with us even when we don't see what you're doing. God, help us to run the race to completion. Help us to strive to live for you and let you live through us. In Jesus' name, amen.